All right, so let's get started. Uh, thank you for coming. Pleasure welcoming you to this wise public lecture. We have a distinguished uh, presenter, a guest uh, from Siemens Canada. We, uh, Siemens Canada will be introducing him in a, in a second before uh, our required or needed territorial, territorial acknowledgement. University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the, ter in the, tra on the traditional territory of the neutral Ashinabar and Ashinabar and Haudenosaunee people. Need more practice on that. Our, our main campus is situated on the Haldimark track, the land granted to the six nations that include six miles of each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Relations. Okay, so let me introduce uh, our, our guest, uh, Mr. Faisal Kasi. Faisal Kasi, sorry. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Siemens Canada. Uh, he's responsible uh, for leading the overall stra stra strategic management directions and leadership of Siemens activities in Canada. In addition to his role as president and CEO, Mr. Kasi is responsible for the leadership of the smart infrastructure business and serves as a board member of multiple Siemens affiliates in Canada. He joined Siemens in 1980 and has worked in various areas of the organization, including Siemens Energy, Industry, IT, and infrastructure businesses. 1990. Okay. Oh, 1990. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, 1990. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, the Netherlands, Brazil, and the United States. In 2011, he joined Siemens Canada as the regional and sales head of the Transformers business in North and South America. He has also led the Siemens Transition Division for North America. He is the board, he's on the board of directors of the Business Council of Canada, the Toronto Board of Trade, and the Canadian German Chamber of Industry and Commerce. So related to you guys. He he holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and a master's in business administration, a passionate champion of Siemens Canada Corporate Social Responsibilities Program. Mr. Cassie takes trade, takes pride in giving back to the community. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, he's going to be talking about, as you can see, the grid of the future, which is quite appropriate now nowadays. Uh, as you are aware, the, there's uh, all throughout the world, in Canada in particular, this, this Net Zero Initiative 2050. And part of that transition is going to be based, of, the backbone of it is going to be the grid that we were talking about. So it's a great opportunity to for this this business and, and welcome uh, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about the grid of the future. And I've been in this business for more than 20 years uh, in the energy business. And I think it's the most exciting time to be in because of the kind of transformation uh, we are going to see in the electric grid. Uh, I can, I think, for surety say we have not seen it in the last 100 years. Uh, and the drivers for this transformation is, uh, you know, the electrification of the trans uh, transportation sector. So electric cars, all these cars will need to be charged. And at the same time, also it's our focus towards sustainability because we want to move uh, from fossil fuel generation into renewable generation uh, to save the planet. Uh, before I start my lecture, maybe a short introduction about, uh, about my company. Uh, last year, uh, we celebrated our 175th anniversary. Uh, this gentleman is Werner von Siemens. He's the founder of the, of the company. And this is the pointer telegraph, which was one of his inventions. Uh, it has a significance uh, for Canada as well. If you look at this ship, uh, this ship is called, it was a Siemens ship, C.S. Faraday. And in 1874, uh, this ship laid the first telegraph line or the first digital connection between North America and Europe. So it was from Atlantic Canada going into Ireland. And uh, at that time, people said uh, Siemens has connected the old and the new worlds, old world being Europe. And in Europe, North America was known as the new world. So that's a long history uh, in, in Canada. Uh, so just to give you uh, a bit of numbers, so we are around uh, more than 300,000 employees across the world in 190 countries, about 72 billion or more than 100 billion Canadian dollars of revenue, 
uh, reasonable uh, profit margin from our industrial business. The strength of Siemens and the lifeblood of my company is, is innovation. So we are so innovative that uh, like the last 30 years I've been with the company, every five to 10 years, we even disrupt our own sales. But we focus on innovation. So we spend around 5.6 billion euros on research and development through our 46,000 employees. And what that does is, uh, we have about four and a, more than four and a half thousand inventions every year. So if you would do the math, uh, every working day, we have 20 inventions. So just today, by the end of the day, 20 new inventions would have come up uh, somewhere in the world, somewhere my colleagues. So that's, uh, we are very, very proud of it, and we invest in the future. So coming to sustainability, I think climate change, as we all understand, uh, is the biggest challenge we all face as humanity. And so we were one of the first companies in 2015 where we already declared, and that's about seven, eight years ago when nobody was talking about sustainability. We said we are going to go net zero by 2030. Uh, we, measured, we measure it. There's a lot of investment going in it. And then we already 55% down also from the 2019 value, and we are on track for 2030. We are also, you know, doing the, uh, the EV, EP, and RE, this means all renewable energy in our buildings. Uh, all our cars are going to be electric cars, and our, all our buildings will be net zero. So that's what we're doing. And it is a task because we have a lot of factories around the world. So it's not like we only have offices here heavy production facilities and we want to bring them net zero. We are on that track. So just a bit about Siemens uh, Canada. So we are uh, just celebrating also our 110th anniversary in Canada. The company was formed formally, although we were here in 1874, laying that telegraph line. The company was formed in 1912. So we just celebrated that uh, long legacy which we have in Canada. We're around 33 offices across across Canada and more than 4,000 employees. So maybe I thought I'd just share, and that's what we had in my last slide on Siemens, is uh, our purpose. So we are a very purpose-driven organization. Uh, we believe the sole purpose of any company is to create benefit for the society. And I say it publicly, if a company cannot create benefit for the society, it has no right to exist. So that's what our culture, what is our values are. So this is our strategy. So we want to first priority number one, address climate change uh, and using our technology and we can make a real impact and we do make an impact. So that's first infrastructure, energy, transportation, industrial sector, infrastructure, especially buildings uh, globally are causing more than 30 to 40% of greenhouse gases, depending on, on the countries. And, and so there's a huge potential there. The second element is digital transformation. We believe a lot of our challenges can be solved through digitalization. Digitalization has a lot of potential. You know, getting, you know, bringing the physical and the virtual worlds together, looking at data and optimizing your physical world using the data. So we are very, very strong. We are on the uh, collision conference we are going to, uh, which is being held in Toronto in June. We are going to launch our acceleration platform. It's an ecosystem with 80 to 100 other partners. Uh, these are uh, interoperable, scalable softwares which we are putting there to help our customers uh, you know, facilitate their, their energy transition. Then the fourth industrial revolution, uh, a purpose for us in Canada, we, when we do the global benchmarks, we see the Canadian industry is lagging behind. Other countries are ahead when it comes to automation of uh, their production facilities. So we have taken up this mission to, uh, to you know, facilitate uh, the, the rollout of, and we call it I4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution into Canada. And then cybersecurity, we just launched uh, last uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, the first cyber defense center, which focuses on critical infrastructure. Uh, cyber security is becoming a big challenge. Uh, all the focus in the past has been on the IT side. Now, by 2029, just to put this in perspective, 4 billion devices, 
4.4 billion people are connected to the Internet of Things, and we all are part of it. And we know the moment we connected, it changed our lives. And now you can imagine through the fourth industrial revolution by 2029, more than 15 billion machines will be connected to the Internet of Things. And imagine the amount of data they are going to put. So there is a lot of, uh, and, and, and cybersecurity of critical infrastructure is, is, is a different beast than IT because if you have IT compromised, or maybe your data is compromised, your private email is compromised, or your bank data. But imagine you are driving through a traffic light uh, and with your car, imagine that, and the, light, the traffic light is green on both sides. That's what uh, cybersecurity for critical infrastructure is about. So then, soft topic based society, I mentioned, we are very, very society oriented. We have a lot of CSR programs. And then our mission is to be the safest employer in Canada. Luckily, the last two years, we were nominated as safest employer in Canada. And we, we are working towards becoming the most diverse and inclusive company in Canada. This is our, our vision. We're not there yet. But we, everybody is welcome, irrespective of your race, your sexual orientation, or whatever. That seems. So now let's uh, come to the topic: uh, energy transition. Uh, can someone define for me what is energy transition? You're in the class, right? I can ask questions. Energy from positive to renewable. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. That's a great answer. Your professor helped you today. <laughs> so that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So, so here, if you see, this is the global energy mix uh, today. You are seeing here. So if you look, we have a lot of coal, we have oil, and we have natural gas, and natural fuels. So till here, it's all creating greenhouse gases. Right? That's a huge... So energy transition is about reducing these and increasing wind, solar, hydro, and bioenergy. So we reduce the greenhouse gases emissions uh, from our from our planet. So this is what energy transition is about. Now we can be in Canada. We are very fortunate that if you look, we have a lot of hydro, we have nuclear, which has the issue of the waste, but once the waste is managed, it's still renewable because there are no emissions coming in. And then we have natural gas and coal. So the energy transition in Canada is a bit different, a bit less dramatic than you would imagine in other countries because of the energy mix. Nevertheless, it is dramatic in some provinces. So if you look at Saskatchewan, if you look at Atlantic Canada, some of the regions, uh, if you look at Alberta, there's a lot of coal there. On the other hand, uh, British Columbia is almost fully renewable. Uh, Quebec is uh, renewable. Manitoba is renewable. So, so there's a different mixed picture uh, when you go into the different provinces. And we have been pretty good in reducing our, our emissions, uh, which, is, which is really good. Okay. So now, as you mentioned uh, when we were discussing, uh, Canada has made a very strong commitment. So we, we have said that we're going to go net zero by 2050, uh, reduce 40 to 45% versus the 2005 levels already by 2030, net zero electricity grid by 2035, and 100% cars by 2035 electric. That's huge. Imagine all these cars have to be charged. And it takes a lot of charge, a lot of electricity to charge a vehicle. I think some of you are driving electric cars. So, so this is a really huge commitment. And now what I'm going to talk about is uh, looking back, we as a global company have been part of all energy transition projects in the world. Uh, starting from Germany, we call it the Energy Vende. Uh, and we have seen how all these projects go and what are the outcomes of these. And based on this, uh, we want to now reflect, can, can, we, can the world have a successful energy transition? You know, 
making a target saying, okay, 2050. Okay, that's like if I'm a politician and so on, that's far away, I won't be even there by 2050. I make an argument, but is it really realistic? What are the issues? So let me share with you our learnings, what we have seen uh, in real life, it's not theory, uh, that it's a complex undertaking, energy transition. It's not an easy one. Uh, so the first thing, when you look at a traditional energy, the structure of the energy system, it's all, it's based on centralized generations, big power plant, big hydropower plant, big nuclear power plant, or coal or gas, and then going from generation to demand to the consumer. So what is the voltage level in Canada? Let me ask you all engineers. Not you, but what is the voltage <laughs> level you get in your plug? 110, 60 or 110, okay? So now, when they are transmitting, what, what are these stations? These are substations. So they are stepping it up. So if you're in Ontario, they will step it up to 500,000 volts, 500 kV. If you're in Quebec, you could even go 765 kV. Now, why do they step it up? Why, because if, why, won't be easier? 110, 210. Why are they putting to 500,000? It's more dangerous and then stepping it up and then stepping it down. Is it to reduce energy loss? Yes, okay. reduce energy losses, yeah. Because the higher the voltage, the less the losses, yeah. And if you want to have even less losses, and there are many lines in Canada, then you convert it from alternating current to direct current because it's almost zero losses. Okay. So we have two lines in Alberta, we have Manitoba, we have in Quebec, we have multiple high water DC lines. Okay, so what energy transition does is it fundamentally changes the system structure. Because when we're talking about renewable energy sources, we are talking about wind power, we're talking about solar power, we're talking about small bio. So all these things like Solar power you can put in your home. So we a lot of people started putting solar panels on their home. And this has been subsidized in many countries. For example, in Germany, uh, there was a huge subsidy. So 30 on a, on a Sunday morning, 30% of the energy is coming from private solar. Uh, and uh, the, the, all the make 30% is private owned solar there. Yeah? And on Sunday morning, it could be that the whole country is running on privately owned solar when they're feeding it back into the grid. So, but what it does is, it's all distributed. So we move from a centralized generation, unidirectional flow of energy to a distributed generation and a multi-directional. So the energy is flowing in both directions. And the system is not designed for that. Our system, you recall, is designed like this. And this is why the utilities have to invest to make sure the system is, is not weak, it's managing. So there's a lot of patchwork that goes on, and that is why the electricity prices start increasing. So if you, if you live in Germany or in Denmark, Denmark is 40 euro cents per kilowatt hour. Germany is 38. And 70 now, right? 70 now? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so even 70. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and then I see here, sometimes in Manitoba, when it goes from 7 Canadian cents to 8, everybody's screaming. <laughs> and saying, oh, we cannot afford it anymore. So, so this is a reality, but this is not that people want to increase the price because they have to spend, invest in the infrastructure. So this is the first complication uh, for your understanding. The second complication, it's about balancing the demand and supply of electricity. So there is a demand, and then demand is coming from people like us. You know, we switch on our air conditioners and heaters, and the utilities have to provide you with that. But there is a challenge. And um, can somebody share with me why is it challenging? Because we have renewable energy, we have energy. What, what's challenging? 
always uh, should be a balance between demand and supply because, because for example, if we is renewable, we generate too much using the sun or wind yeah. and there is no energy storage, we cannot hold all the energy generated on the grid. So we can, I guess, two person or something or less, we can store on the grid. So we should always have a balance between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah, you've done your homework. So, <laughs> so the reason is, one of the reasons, and you're spot on, but the other reason is renewable energy sources, unfortunately, like you said, cannot be stored, so they're intermittent. So let, let's imagine I need 100 megawatts and I put 150 megawatts of solar and 50 megawatts of wind. And you say, oh, your demand is 100 megawatts, I have 150 solar. But what if the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining? So although I invested in 100 megawatts, at that point in time, when it's not, when the clouds are there and the wind is still, I have zero. And this is a huge issue. Because how do you plan if you're a planner? So you have to bring as a utility 100 megawatts from somewhere else, we will call peak power or whatever other power, they, to fulfill the load, otherwise they will be a blackout. So this is a very, and this is again a challenge because you are doubling on generation resources. Other thing is managing of the peak. It's similar to the last thing, that's a challenge. So you know what happens when it's 35 degrees, we all go back in our homes and so sweating and charge on our electric air conditioning and boom, and then the peak comes down. So normally like base load is somewhere here, that's what we can plan for, and suddenly this thing comes. Somebody has to stay, otherwise there will be an outage. So then there are peaker plants, there are other arrangements with your neighbor or with other, but they know because they are not supplying it all the time, this energy. This comes once in a while when it's hot, which is in Canada, could be never, or could be, could be two days in a month. So they charge a premium for that, premium for that electricity. Again, makes everything expensive. A lot of investment. Then, this interesting one, especially in countries where there's a lot of sun, like when you go to Nevada uh, in the US, it's called the utility death spiral. So what happens is, when we start putting solar panels, we, we, it's good, you know, we're getting our own energy, it's nothing to do with the utility. And, uh, and then, uh, what happens is that this is less revenue for the utility. So as I mentioned, uh, in, in Germany, on a sunny Sunday morning when the industry is not running, all the load can be taken from privately owned solar. So basically, utilities have a lot of power still there. What do they do with it? But well, nobody needs it. So what happens is, even in Germany, it went negative pricing. So the utilities are paying people to consume electricity. And the German neighbor is Austria, they have pump storage power plants. So they, they get paid to store water up. In the morning when the industry comes back, they can sell at a heavy price, right? So this is, this is also a big issue because the more DERs are coming, less revenue for the utility. But they still have to maintain the infrastructure. So what they do is they increase their rates to make sure, because they need a certain revenue to take care of all these complexities. And then everybody starts screaming, oh, the prices are going up, uh, because this we come in this kind of a situation. And Nevada was pretty tricky when all the casinos started putting their own microgrids, and like you're also putting. So the moment you would put, a, which utility serves you here? Yeah, for a loop. For a loop. So the moment you will put your micro grid, you take megawatts of their revenue. Oh, you be yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. So, so what you're seeing based on the things I showed you, that you know the interruptions are going up because the system is not being changed. Things are things are different. It's not designed for that. There's a lot of intermittency. So the consumer interruptions are going up. People are getting upset. Oh, I don't have electricity, especially in the rural area. And at the same time, the number of weather-related events are increasing. 
we can statistically see that there are more ice storms, there are more hurricanes, and this is what climate change is about. So, and every time a hurricane hits, boom, it takes off a few lines away, right? And then you just have again run, transform, failing, this, that. So, so this is another challenge. So what happens is uh, all that uh, becomes an economic burden, becomes expensive, you know? Like in Denmark, I told you, 40 cents. Germany, 70 cents more. Huh? So, and we had it in Ontario as well. Prices went up a bit. So then people start becoming, you know, a bit, a bit upset. If they have to pay more. And it becomes a political challenge from economic to political. Industry gets upset if energy is part of their production, you know, uh, basic uh, parameters. And then it becomes political and then starts stalling. And this we have seen in many areas. So now, so how do we crack this code? How do we make a economically viable energy transition? And I thought I'll come here. People told me the University of Waterloo is the top students in the world, or in Canada at least. So I'm looking for an answer for the world. Okay. So I'm looking for an answer. How do we solve this now? What? How can we? Like I showed you all these problems. What can we do to make it economically viable? That it's not like a huge tax burden. Is there any ideas? Seems you have some. Hmm? Just using energy storage. Energy storage. Of, You're spot on. In a, so instead of exporting to other country and the price goes minus. We can just store, and when we have high demand, we can release the energy. Absolutely. It's part of the puzzle. Anyone else? Maybe invest a bit more in nuclear, because then you don't need to worry about the distributed systems, and you can yeah. continue with the... That's what Ontario is doing. Nuclear. It's a different... Uh, in some countries, there's a mixed opinion, uh, because some countries think that, you know, the nuclear has the fuel, which has to somewhere dump, but if, there, if it leaks somehow, it will be very, very bad or catastrophic. So there's some political or social resistance to nuclear, but I think that is also weaning away as the prices are going up. Yeah. It should also be like, I know they don't need to the contract from the utility with the customers. Mm -hmm. Because a different system requires a different business model. Absolutely. And not just only like the, the utility challenge to the, to the customer, but also like to make a bi-directional like, upgraded, most of the you know, I'm still doing with the typical contract. I give you energy and you pay how much yeah. you pay. And if you don't pay, if you don't use, you pay. But mm. as mentioned, like uh, upgrading the system, upgrading the metering system. Yeah. Which is what the customer wants. Mm. Mm. Okay. Finding alternate forms of energy like hydrogen driven net zero system. Yeah. Also part of the story, which are, which are reliable, not intermittent. Okay. Anyone else? All right. So some of our thoughts, and I share you uh, with you what we are doing. So new technologies, you stop spot on, uh, like battery storage systems, combined with renewable, combined with a microgrid. Uh, this can you know remove the intermittency. So when in the night when the wind is blowing and nobody's using it, you can still store it and then you can use it later. Other, I already mentioned uh, digitalization is to utilize the, you know, the power of data. Like today in the province we are in Ontario, there are, to my estimation, more than 500 megawatts of energy, which is behind the meter. So there is no visibility or no control on that. And what if we could integrate that resource in it and be able to control it uh, or use the power of data to understand how the weather is going to change and then use that we could optimize. Uh, you said it, new business models. And one of the models I like about it, so there are two ways. Like the government takes taxpayer money and puts nuclear power plants, big power plants, buy storage, et cetera, et cetera. But then think about, think about what Uber did. Uh, Uber is the largest transportation company in the world. It doesn't own a single car. 
How interesting is that? Not a single driver. So what it did was it kind of crowdsourced. It said it created a digital platform coming back to digitalization. And it said, look, you know, your car is standing in the garage and you're sitting in front of Netflix. So why don't you maybe, you know, register on this platform and you can drive a bit and drive somebody else. You have a car, you have you have time, and then you earn fifty dollars and then pays for your Netflix in one day. Right? So that was a very exciting thing for everybody. Okay, right. And people have you know left. I know people who left their profession and just are Uber drivers. Uh, in you know, I met somebody in Dubai who when I was there and said, oh, you know what? Just give me the flexibility. I can decide when I can go and make enough money. Uh, I don't need it, and I'm I, I'm the happiest man. So so that's so maybe utilities can also think like we were saying. So if I put a solar panel uh, and I have any excess energy, maybe I'm on vacation, then maybe I can sell it to my neighbor or sell it back to the utility or do something else with it, right? So, but there has to be an incentive. And future, like you talked about batteries, when imagine in 2035, everybody has a car, electric car. There's a huge battery in the system now. And I don't know if you know the, the new Ford 150 Lightning truck. It can charge back your home and sustain it for two, three days. It has the ability, the battery is so big. So suddenly, you know, I could say if I'm on vacation and my car is standing and I have an app and I say, okay, discharge it when the utility needs it, when the price is the highest. And I come back and I earn $200 because my car was, was of service to the system. So this is about the new business model. And then of course, and I talk a bit more about if we need to re uh, a regulatory reform, if we want to do things like Uber uh, in the electricity sector. So this was our answer. Uh, we studied all the energy transitions. You have to tell me if I'm off time, right? We'll have a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> so what we do is we create an energy system platform, we call it. And the platform has APIs. It connects to all distributed energy sources. And it's a cloud-based platform. So you can use data, you can do analytics, and you can create a marketplace around it. And it has, and you optimize the overall system. So if you have, let's say, I'll just give you an example. If there are 10 homes, everybody puts a solar panel, everybody has, a, a, you know, in their home. And if you connect these homes together, you may need six panels because maybe the usage is different. Somebody's retired, use the energy in the morning, somebody works, come back, use energy. So if you can trade it, as a, there is a potential, if you connect everything to optimize the system. So that's exactly what we, we say. So, so the main levers I go quickly in the interest of time, having transparency of, of the overall system behind the meter system. So we have transparency, you can optimize it. The demand side becomes extremely important. So it's not only the generation side, it's also about, has anybody heard of load shedding where you have no electricity? That's one way because you know there's in certain countries uh, where I come from, like for example in Pakistan originally, load shedding means there is no electricity form, it's gone. You're sitting there for a couple of hours. But a more smart building load shedding could be that it's suddenly switches some of the lights off, some of the loads off, switches air conditioner for a while out, and still create a load shedding without the user knowing that. So that's why smart buildings and smart homes, which are connected to the grid, become important. Crowdsourcing of energy, I talked about the Uber model. That's, that's what I uh, say to our government and say, look, why do you want to invest billions in big power plants? Create a system which encourages people to put batteries and solar panels in their homes and crowdsource some of them. That's part of the problem. Part of the solution could be, of course, will not solve everything, but it could be part of that. And then let utilities orchestrate the overall system while having visibility and have the ability to optimize. And new revenue models for the utilities. Today, the utility revenue model is buy an equipment, put it in the grid, 
put it on the rate base. What we are saying, give them the Uber model. So when you are selling your energy to him, utility still gets a charge. That's how Uber runs, yeah? Takes 15% cut or and so on. So these are the ideas. The fact is, and it is something which we all need to understand. They are, the two worlds are merging. So the world of energy sector or electricity energy sector and the buildings, the infrastructure are merging. Because the moment you have chargers, you have solar panels, you have batteries in the building, it's merged. And this is very, very exciting because two different sectors now merge and they have to work together to find a solution. And, and that's, uh, that's the exciting part here. It's like if you're you're engineering students, all of you, I assume, and what if we have a class where you put the arts students with you and could get a bit of uh, with a different flavor in the whole thing. So it's a bit of a merge. And so that's the, the, the marketplace uh, where we allow everybody to, uh, with using AI, optimize the system, but also creates a business model in which everyone can uh, participate in the, in the cloud space, in the marketplace. And actually, this is not a vision. Uh, we are doing a project. It's a $93 million project, uh, which is uh, financed by the federal government of Canada, 36 million. And it's a research and development project where we are really piloting this. So there's a town of Shed yet where they are, the, the residents are participating in that pilot. So there are 70 homes and they have these battery systems and then they are, uh, they are, they are you know, part of the grid and they are supporting. And one of the big advantage was when Hurricane Fiona hit uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, these homes were the only one which had power because they, they, were, they had their own batteries and they could, they could do that. So very, and the, and the platform is running already. So it's a very exciting project which we are piloting and, and we hope we could uh, roll it out across the country and other, other countries. So with that, uh, I'll just summarize it with a short video, which kind of explains everything which. Energy systems are undergoing major changes today. Decarbonization is driving an increase in renewable energy generation. This leads to further decentralization of these assets and is driving the electrification of transportation. Our world is more and more connected. Digitalization and the Internet of Things are changing utilities' business models. The energy transition is challenging. It could become quite expensive with redundancies in backup generation capacity additional need for grid infrastructure upgrades, and various operating systems controlling different aspects of the overall energy system. All this can result in consumer price increases and lower profits. How can Siemens help organizations make sense of the energy future? Through Siemens Energy System Platform, ESP. The ESP is an Internet of Things cloud-based platform for energy the platform can connect to a wide array of energy resources, such as generators, batteries, solar, EV chargers, and even entire microgrids. This platform comes with many benefits. The first benefit is reduced backup capacity. The ESP includes load management programs to decrease backup generation costs. It does this by allowing the utility to spread out the load, thereby reducing peak demand. Another benefit is by having transparency into prosumer assets. Renewable power is intermittent, and the ESP helps by bundling renewable power generation to ensure reliability. The ESP helps utilities to converge and manage all their distributed resources across their systems to increase flexibility. With this transparency, the utility can optimize in real time their distribution network operation on the grid. This improves resiliency of the system and benefits the utility by avoiding costly grid upgrades. Lastly, it opens up new opportunities to generate revenue and embrace transactional business models. It can provide consumers with a platform to trade energy in their community and allows everyone to participate in the energy system. Utilities and authorities worldwide leverage Siemens experience to make the right choices for a smart, innovative, and cost-efficient energy transformation. It's time to shape a cleaner, 
more sustainable energy future. question that we have to take. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting presentation, very relevant. I guess I open the floor for, for questions. If you have any, uh, let me start. Let me start with one in particular regarding the, if you can tell us a bit more about the project that you, are, you describe at the end, uh, who the partners are and, and how this is, it's only the so yeah. equipment as well, or it's just so the sort of software? Or? So the partners are, uh, Nova Scotia Power, that's the utility in uh, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick Power, that's the utility in the province of New Brunswick. So these are two, uh, two partners. It is also about it's a platform, but it's microgrid, but it's also about the equipment and the hardware. So it's the whole system uh, which we connect to the energy system platform, the distributed energy sources. So there are sources like they are testing also electric cars integration. They are connecting with buildings, large buildings like uh, like you have here. And a building can, you know, the demand response side do up to 200 kilowatts of, of response. And then at the same time, we have then water heaters, uh, like they're in New Brunswick, they're electric water heaters, they are smart water heaters, they are connected, they could be, uh, you know, they, they, they could be managed, their load could be managed to, to, you know, to kick them in at a different time versus when, when mostly people are kicking in, in the early in the morning. So it's a, it's a whole, and the community is involved. So there, as I said to you, there are 70 families uh, which have the system connected and they can see and they can see what's going on. So it's, it's a pilot to show and demonstrate that there's also another way, just like what we call Uber of the utilities. Interesting. Is Enarcan involved in this? Excuse me? Enarcan? Yeah, Enarcan is there. You are working with Enarcan as well. And there is a report, if you are interested, and friends have a yeah. report, I will send, I uh, send to you. and the, and the platform is is ready. So if you are interested in the platform, you know, your, your whole campus is like a city, you could also play with that. Certainly, thank you. Daniel, you had a question? Thank, uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Really insightful. Uh, yeah. Use the microphone because it's being recorded. Record. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, well, thank, thank you so uh, much for- the people online as well. Oh, thank you so much for the presentation, it was really insightful. I have uh, two questions. Uh, First of all, it will be a follow-up with a question for the smart grid program. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know like usually as, as uh, the pilot, like uh, in charge, the pilot person responsible for the program, it is easier just to convince like uh, uh, students in academia of all the, the, the what you can provide. Mm -hmm. How can you encourage, or how would you, were you able to encourage the customer to participate in this program? Because that's usually one of the, challenges that we have when we want to implement that. Mm -hmm. Where customers, they don't want to have something built over there because they consider probably the prices, initial prices, initial costs will be too expensive. Even if they don't have to pay it, they sometimes like are reluctant yeah. just to go over there. It's a, it's a very good question. So convincing the customers, I think there is a lot of, a lot of awareness around climate change. So we did see that people are very excited about, you know, being part of the solution. Uh, and secondly, now, as I mentioned to you in Hurricane Fiona, uh, they firsthand saw the benefits of such a system because they had powers and their neighbors didn't have power. And uh, so, so that is also creating a different effect that other people who are not part of the pilot, even saying, oh, can we become part of the pilot as well? Uh, which we have to, of course, think about it because the pilot was, is for a specific thing. So I think there is uh, there is understanding. And uh, coming back to your question, how do you scale it? So you're right, pilot is easy, but how do you scale it? And that is why we we kind of present and say, okay, create a, a create, create a marketplace where there is an incentive. Because without the incentive, like if I'm a consumer, I have a hydro Waterloo or hydro one, or I live in Oakland Hydro, uh, Oakland Hydro. I would say, look, you know, it's not my responsibility. I need electricity. The utility should take care of it. But if I create a business model where, like Uber, like why would anybody drive their cars from third party? Because there's incentive where they're paid. So if you can create a model where you can charge back, give you money, 
or or you know dry, uh, or you know putting back more energy from your solar panel into the grid gives you also some money and gives you resiliency at home as well so there's no outages etc so that is the kind of incentive we have to create and that's what i meant with the regulatory reform that we need to you know create a create a different mechanism where people are motivated you can force people to do that yeah, and I'm pretty sure after the hurricane, there will be more people yeah, according okay. to that. Uh, that. One last short question. Uh, is the energy system platform open source? Because I mean, I saw that it was open cloud. Is this uh, open source or? No, you're asking about my... <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, yeah, it's it's fully open, I don't think it's fully open source, but what it is, it's an open system. So it has open APIs. So because we don't want to... Uh, the software is critical. It's managing critical assets. So we, we don't open source it, but we open API it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Gaudi, there is an online question. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you, can you read it? Uh, here's the microphone. Yeah. I will read. I think it's uh, it's a long one. Let me see. <laughs> okay, so the, so the question is, hello, sir. I am from OPG. The recent IESO's pathways to net zero suggest that Ontario will transition from a summer peaking province to a winter peaking province. This means that we need far more generation capacity during winter than during summer. What are your thoughts on managing the surplus capacity during the summer month? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. So if there is surplus capacity, I think if we have uh, connections uh, with other areas uh, and interconnections, that could be could be one way. The other way would be uh, create an incentive system that the surplus capacity is used. And I think in going forward, when everybody has an electric car, there will be a lot of use. So if you can create attractive price for people to to charge their cars. Uh, they will jump on it and charge if it's cheaper. So I think this game of supply and demand, and um, uh, as you are from OPG, I think you understand this really well and maybe better than me, but we are in our models when we are looking forward, we feel if we want to optimize the overall system, uh, we may need dynamic rates. Dynamic rates means when there is excess, less capacity, then the race gets expensive, which which people are now we have night, day, and we have fixed like kind of three things. Really dynamic. So you know it's like an app and you know it's getting expensive. I better shut down my, my washing machine and, and 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 this will not be done manually. You will set it up and say, okay, stop the machine if it's more than that. But and then if your surplus capacity, the rates are going to come down, and that is where people are going to kick in and charge their things, uh, charge their electric cars and, and utilize energy. Uh, so that's what we feel we should play with that. Thank you. That, that's an interesting uh, question and answer. However, there's a, and, and you mentioned that, there's a political undertone to all of this, mm -hmm. which, uh, which, because we did have dynamic prices at some point, that didn't happen because there was a, a revolt by the, mm -hmm. by the voters. So that's a major challenge as well. There's a political side to all this. What is your opinion on all that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, as I said, it becomes a political issue. Uh, but I think uh, the thing at stake uh, is our planet, is our livelihood. It's the biggest challenge we face as humanity, climate change. So I think as the technology advances, we will have to change about, we will have to, like you say, political reform. We will have to maybe do a regulatory reform. It's not going to be easy. That's why I say it's a very complex undertaking. So you have to, it's, it's a journey. And I think what we are trying to do in New Brunswick trying uh, and Nova Scotia is trying to show that this can also work, right? And I think the, uh, the, it has to be attractive for the utility and as well as the consumer. Like when, I, when you look at like areas where there are a lot of sun, we, you don't want to put your utility into a utility debt spiral like putting solar all the way and their revenue going down. So what we are saying there is, the utility should always be the orchestra and they they also have transactional business models. Yes, today it's not there and if somebody will try to implement, then maybe there will be resistance. 
But that is when I think uh, leadership comes in. If you believe in it and if you feel that's the right solution, then we will have to go for that. Right? Thank you. I have another question. Yeah, just one. Yeah, you did mention about the incentivizing the consumer. So assuming the pilot goes all well and you want to scale it up, uh, would you be looking to to install the system in? Would you want the consumer to pay for it or would you like do some partnership with the government to like make it mass? Like which which way would work? Because there's an incentive for the government as well, right? You're coming up with the new system, yeah. So which way would you think about moving? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a choice the stakeholders will have to make. Because the system alone, without the support uh, of the utility, uh, it's not going to fly. Like in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, utility are the key partners in this. Yeah? So the utility is on game, and the government is on game, and the regulators are agree to it, then the system will be put in. And it's like any platform, it's like a SaaS model, it's a software as a service. You can just, just put it and use it. And the benefits, if you make a transactional business model and transaction revenues, those will go to the utility. So there, there will be a benefit for somebody who's uh, applying it. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions online? Uh, nothing. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I don't know if you've heard in the news, but three days ago, Germany shut down his last nuclear power plant. Um, so now Germany's running not on nuclear power anymore. What's your perspective on this, like your personal perspective? Do you think it was a smart decision or not? It's running on coal now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, you know, I, I lived in Germany for 16 years myself, yeah? so it's like my second hometown. And I and I feel uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, how would I call it, not tragedy, but so we invested so much, uh, give so many subsidies, so there's a lot of penetration on solar, but, uh, if you look at the carbon emissions, they have gone up just because of that reason that the coal fire plants are, are booming now. Yeah? So I I think it's uh, it was a bit premature, my opinion, yeah. to go away from my personal opinion from nuclear so fast. It was, you know, when uh, some incidences happened, it was a mindset, it was a culture. Everybody said we don't want to have it. Uh, I think uh, when we when the in Ukraine when there was this this power plant Chernobyl, Chernobyl and I think there was an issue in Germany as well because the wave came in and for many years people were not allowed to eat the, the vegetables in the garden so people at that time was a very strong sentiment to say you know shut down so I think at that from that perspective it was the right decision but I think uh, it's a bit of a challenge now especially with. Uh, in hindsight, it's easier said because now with the Ukraine war and Russian gas away, so it's very challenging. Like, in, uh, like a lot of more most efficient uh, combined cycle power plants got stranded because it was maybe cheaper to run coal than to run that gas plant. So I feel it was a bit fast because now if you're taking energy from France, it's also nuclear. So what's the point, right? So it should have been maybe more. I think Germany went ahead, led. But everybody else were like still staying on their nuclear, so it's a so it's still the same thing, right? Germany, like in Europe, so maybe it was a bit too, in my opinion, too fast. Could have gone a bit slow on that, and then uh, then then converted now because it's it's a real pity that a country invested so much money and so much effort and so much like people in Germany said we will pay thirty eight. We are environmentally so it's, it's the courage of the people who was there. But now the green up the carbon emissions are the, it's gone up, right? So you know the outcome was not there, what we require. Interesting question because you, you did mention social acceptance. Yeah. You know, target is very high. Very high. For nuclear, the 70, 70 plus percent people think that it's fine. Yeah. And here, the here, major here. opposition in Ontario tends to be on price cost, right? Because mm -hmm. most of the reason why we're paying more 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 for electricity is the nuclear renewable mm -hmm. Bruce, right? And now they're talking about Darlington, so it's a yeah. position in that regard. But nuclear itself is considered safe, yeah, environmentally, uh, here I in Ontario. Mean, but yeah, I mean, it, it changes wherever you go. Exactly. In Italy, in 1980, mm -hmm. they passed a, pass a referendum. The nuclear was banned. Mm -hmm. And they are just downwind from France. And they're getting all the electricity from France. So 
I, I would just say if you manage the, a point. if you manage a nuclear power plant well, it is from a greenhouse emissions perspective, it is zero greenhouse emissions. So it's it's okay. I think the only question mark which comes is around the fuel, because it's dumped somewhere, it stays radioactive for centuries. What happens? Yeah? What happens if a big earthquake comes and boom, this thing is out? This is what people think. Yeah, that's one of the challenges in Ontario, what to do with the yeah. with the with the waste. Any yeah. any other questions? Yeah, the no, not one. I have one uh, last question again. Uh, really interesting presentation. Net zero by 2035, uh, which uh, I believe is a, is a good uh, pathway to go to, to reduce carbon emissions. But that brings a new challenge, which is the capacity. We basically will be charging massive like batteries around the, all the grid. Is, I remember reading in the notes, is there is a plan that uh, that goes in parallel will like the transition the the future fuel cars to electric car to meet the capacity from now to 12 years yeah that, that's what the participant in on, uh, on the opg mentioned so there is a uh, ontario plan which is looking at demand curves for years ahead and then trying to find solutions uh, which is uh, small and medium reactors uh, so smr uh, and other other areas, and and what we what I also commented on that report when I when I read it, uh, I commented that we should include more of this distributed as well. It's not the answer. What what I've said, it's not the answer for everything, but it could be part of the solution. And I think uh, other thing which Ontario is also doing is about you know reducing the load. You can we can reduce the consumption. We don't need to have ten lights running. Uh, you know sometimes I. I become very conscious uh, because in the buildings business, like Natalia, you as well. So when I go in a in a like a wedding hall and I see like five hundred uh, port lights uh, run lights running, and I do, do I really need all these lights? Yeah. And so you know how you know do I close the lights, switch off the light? So so I think there's a whole play. There'll be a uh, a whole list of things which we have to do. To you know, reduce the consumption at the same time, make the engineering because alone one sector will not be able to do it. You're fully right. The electricity demand is going to skyrocket when everybody has an electric car. And I can tell you, it will be even more problematic. Even if you have, imagine you have the energy. When you have all the energy, so if you live in a lane where there are ten homes or twenty homes, and everybody has two electric cars. You know, you see this green box outside, that's the distribution yeah, transformer. Maybe that's not enough for all this load. So maybe you have to put new transformers. Maybe even the wire, there is the wire which is underground now, maybe it's too thin for all that load. Maybe they have to pull out the wire. So this is going to be very, could get very expensive if you do not manage it properly. It's a very complicated uh, thing. And I think public will really have to, you know, you cannot say on one side, oh, I need green and I'm, you know, and you have to pay, uh, there's a price for, uh, they, they, this is a transition. Yeah, yeah, inter interesting point, now, now it, we've done a lot of studies in electric vehicles and I think that one part of the solution is managing that, as opposed to just servicing Absolutely. whatever you want. Uh, and, and I have a few ideas about that, we have worked uh, significantly that. The problem is, as Dario said, is convincing the user to, yeah. To allow, to allow, allow you the utility to manage it. To manage. So that's a major that challenge. Is yeah. that, is, that is, of course, but that is also, it's also about the incentive you, you can create. Yeah? Well, I think you can also use the care, the, the, well, the care approach, approach, and it's the stick approach, it. which is what happened, uh, it's already happening. He said, oh, I want a, a, you know, a, a level two charger phone. And then the utility comes back to do, well, no more. Your neighbors already have it. Transformer is overloaded. You pay for the transformer. So, yeah. so that's that's what yeah. is happening effectively. That's, that's, effective. Effective. that's yeah. going to happen. Right? That's so that's a stick approach. Too. That's a stick approach. Yeah. Stick but anyway, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate. Thank you very much for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.